Amen. Amen. Thank you, choir. Uh, appreciate that choir so much. I always say it, it takes us a little bit of time to get out of the choir loft when it's over, but um, aren't they a blessing? I love that. And Carol, thank you for playing this morning. And thank you for being here to worship with us. Um, this is a, a great day for us to get to gather, gather together um, in God's house um, and to give him thanks. I know we're coming up on that this week and uh, kind of reminded of that in just a little bit. Uh, we're going to enjoy a time of fellowship around the table, um, and we're going to enjoy some good food. But most of all, as we enjoy that good food, we're going to look heavenward. 
uh, and be thankful for all of the blessings, um, all of the things that he does uh, for us. And, and we feel very blessed this year getting to do this. Again, I'm going to echo what Trey said. Don't panic if it's kind of wet out there because we've got places you can go to get dry inside and we're going to enjoy a good time of fellowship together. And I'm looking forward to that. Hope that you will stay and join us for that time. Um, even if you didn't bring anything, there'll be plenty of food over there. I can guarantee. And so we want you to come and uh, get to join uh, in that time with you. If you've got your Bible with you this morning, uh, we're going to do something a little bit different. Go ahead and be finding Psalm chapter 34. We're going to be in the 34th Psalm this morning. And I want you to find that if you would real quickly. And um, this morning, once you find it, I'm going to ask you to stand with me this morning in the honor of the reading of God's Word. This is a, a beautiful psalm. It's a lengthy psalm. Um, but we're going to read it together um, this morning, uh, kind of share it with you. If you don't have a Bible with you, there's some pew Bibles right there in front of you. Get, grab one of those. Go to Psalm 34. I can guarantee you, you're going to want to mark this psalm. Um, if you don't have it marked up in your Bible, you're going to make some notes and kind of write some things down because this is a tremendous word from God this morning. And I'm just going to tell you, I'm going to preach this morning, okay? But the most important thing you're going to hear is his word. And so stand with me, if you would, in the honor of the reading of God's Word. I'm going to lead us as um, we read the 34th, 34th Psalm. Um, I'm reading from the New King James. That's what will be on the screen. So please feel free to follow along there if you want to. Um, but I want you to pay close attention to this beautiful Psalm and God's inspired Word. And just let the Holy Spirit speak this to your heart. This ought to reflect your heart as a believer. If you're a Christian in this room today, this is us. So listen close. This is Psalm 34, a Psalm of David. And here's what it says. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me. And delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant, and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. There's no want to those who fear him. The young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Come, you children, and listen to me, and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is the man who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart, and saves such as have a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. He guards all his bones, not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous shall be condemned. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who trust in him shall be condemned. Pray with me if you would. Father, we are truly blessed to get to be in this place together this morning, and with one heart, and one voice worship you. I thank you this morning, God, for those hymns and songs and spiritual songs that we have lifted to you. God, your word says that you inhabit the praises of your people, and God, you inhabit that praise this morning. We thank you for your presence in this place. And God, we hunger for you, your truth, and we thank you for your word that we just read. And we ask that you would allow your Holy Spirit to take your holy word and speak it to us in such a way that it might be life-changing. 
And God, when we get ready to leave this place in a little bit and head over towards our fellowship hall and enjoy a time of fellowship together, may our hearts be so full to overflowing with your word, Father, that as we sit there and partake of food to feed our bodies, we'd be reminded of how blessed we are in you, how full we are in you spiritually and even physically. Thank you for all that you do for us. Let your Holy Spirit fall on this morning and God, may it be life-changing to us. Move on us, shake us, stir us, remind us, save us, heal us, comfort us in this place. And God will give you the praise and the honor and the glory for what you do. It's in your name we ask these things. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. We've been in a short series for the last few weeks um, that we have simply been calling Praying with Praise and Gratitude, and really we've been working towards this day, all right? We've been talking about some of the most powerful prayers in Scripture, but also some of the most powerful prayer advice that we can find in Scripture. And really, this is a series of messages, really, that I just had planned three of those, but it could really go on for quite some time. There's a lot of talk in Scripture about prayer and what prayer ought to look like in the life of a Christian. There are some powerful prayers that are prayed in Scripture, but I wanted us to work up to this day right before Thanksgiving, and I wanted to talk to you this morning about praying with praise and gratitude. You see, I believe that there's power in prayer. I believe that. And I've been preaching it the last three weeks. The most powerful tool that you have in your hand as a believer is the power of prayer. But I'm going to tell you something. The most powerful prayer you pray is a prayer of praise and thanksgiving. That's the most powerful prayer that will come from your lips. And all the time we say things like this, even as Christians, maybe even some Christians who've been a a Christian for a long time, they'll say, I just don't have the words to say. I just don't know what to say when I pray. We even hear the disciples saying to the Lord, teach me how to pray, right? Teach me to pray. We hear that coming from saints of all ages. I'm going to tell you how to pray. Pray thankfully. When you don't know what to say, thank him. Start thanking him. Start letting him bring to your mind all of the wonderful blessings that he's poured out in your life. You see, even when we're going through challenges and difficulties, and we are living in a troubled world in these times, granted, I am telling you that when you bow your head before the Lord, the most powerful prayer you will pray is to acknowledge who he is in praise and thanksgiving. And I'm telling you that will change your life. It'll change your outlook on things. It'll help you to see with God's eyes and a new focus if you'll learn what it means to pray with praise and gratitude. And so I'm just going to kind of point to this psalm this morning in Psalm 34. I want us to see this. Now, we've been talking about prayer for the last few weeks. Folks, the spiritual discipline of prayer, as we've been saying, and, and I mean this, is so needed in our day. We've echoed that for the past three weeks. We are living in troubled times. And we look around at the shape that our world's in, even at the shape of our own country today, and many of us wring our hands and we're worried and we're troubled. And I'm telling you, listen, we could spend all of our days just in unceasing prayer. And by the way, Scripture calls us to that. And I think what our day calls for from believers and from the church is for us to have this revival of prayer. It's one of the most powerful things that you have in your hands. Samuel Chadwick, who's an English minister and early leader of the Methodist church movement who helped to spark revival on two continents, Uh, Samuel Chadwick wrote a little book hundreds of years ago entitled The Path of Prayer. And here's what he said, and I love this. I'm going to share a couple of quotes from The Path of Prayer by Samuel Chadwick. It's an old, old book. It's It's a classic. And here's what he says about prayer. He says, Satan dreads nothing but prayer. His one concern is to keep the saints from praying. He fears nothing from prayerless studies, prayerless work, prayerless religion. He laughs at our toil. He mocks our wisdom, but he trembles when we pray. Remember that. The very thing that can come against the one who holds this world in sway today are your prayers. The prayers of the saints. Another more current pastor that I just love, Francis Chan, said this, the enemy just hates our prayers. It's true. 
the one thing he doesn't want you to do is pray. He will put anything in your path to keep you from praying. And I will tell you that he'll put anything in your path to keep you from praising him, worshiping him, and thanking him, acknowledging that every good and perfect gift comes from him. He will stop us and keep us from giving ourselves to the discipline of prayer. He doesn't want you to develop a prayer life. The enemy doesn't want you to learn how to pray. He doesn't want that because the one thing that terrifies him is that Christians one day might wake up and fall on their knees and begin to pray and God would begin to move and spark revival in this land. And that's what we so need in our day. Samuel Chaddock also said this in his little book about prayer, the path to prayer. He said, there is no power like that of prevailing, you get prevailing, right? Ongoing prayer of Abraham pleading for Sodom, of Jacob wrestling in the stillness of the night, Moses standing in the breach, Hannah intoxicated with sorrow, David heartbroken with remorse and grief, Jesus in sweat and blood. Add to this list from the records of the church your personal observation and experience, and always there is a cost of passion unto blood. Such prayer prevails. It turns ordinary mortals into men of power. It brings power. It brings fire. It brings rain. It brings life. It brings God. Folks, that's why we're talking about prayer. You see, the need of our day is for you and I who call ourselves Christians to pray. And all kinds of prayer. There's all kinds of prayers. But I'm telling you that the most powerful prayer we can begin to speak in our day are simple prayers of thanksgiving for who he is, acknowledging him, calling him into glory. I want you to think about this with me. If you just take a march through Scripture, you will discover that when the walls of Jericho fell, they fell because God's people were marching around it praying prayers of thanksgiving and praise. Not because of weapons they possessed. They carried none because of the prayers of the saints. Most of the battles won in the Old Testament were not made, won with weapons of war that were made by the hands of men, but by prayer of praise and thanksgiving. They praised him, they thanked him, and his spirit fell. And Jesus said to them, be still and I will fight for you. You see, there's nothing more powerful in your hand than just simply you and I learning how to praise and thank him. Now, I'm so glad this morning for that worship service. Beautiful time of worship, right? Just think about the words to those songs. How can I say thanks for the things you've done for me, right? Just count your many blessings. Name them one by one. Those songs that Carol played, give thanks with a grateful heart. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. All of those kind of things put God to work. And I am telling you that I prayed this while ago when I was just praying for this service. The Bible tells us that he inhabits the praises of his people. And I'm telling you that when God inhabits the praises and his presence shows up, things happen. Lives are changed. God begins to move. Revival begins to spark. Fire falls and people are saved and comforted and healed and blessed. Things change when we pray. So can I simply ask you, Why don't we? Why is it the last thing we think of? Why is it the last resort when our backs are against the wall that we get serious about prayer? Why is it that it's kind of an afterthought for us to pray pray a simple prayer that says something like, God help me, I can't handle this. When prayer ought to be the first thing we do. When your feet hit the ground in the morning, thank you Lord for bringing me through the night. When you begin to take your first steps into your day, thank you, Lord, for your presence and your power and your protection as I enter into this day. When you get to the middle of the day and you face some challenges and some struggles in your day, the prayer of thanksgiving and praise ought to rise from your lips. God, thank you for getting me through that one. And when you put your head down on the pillow at night, God, thank you for how you saw me through the day. And when one of these days you close your eyes and rest, the prayer that will cross your lips, well, God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the hope of heaven. Thank you that you carried me and sustained me through the valley of the shadow of death. And now as I emerge on the other side, thank you for heaven that awaits me. I am telling you that the lips of the saints ought to constantly be filled with prayers of praise and thanksgiving. It ought to flow from us. There ought to be no worship 
like what happens in a Christian church. We've got someone and something to worship. There ought to be no thanksgiving like what happens from the saints of Jesus Christ who have so much to be thankful for. And when you look at this psalm in the time that we have today, I want you to think about how prevalent this idea of prayers of praise and thanks, how it permeates scripture. It's so powerful. Folks, the truth is we're to pray all kinds of prayers in all kinds of ways. There's prayers of petition and there's prayers of lament and mourning. There's prayers of repentance and confession. There's prayers for salvation, right? There's prayers for healing. There's prayers of supplication on behalf of other people. On Wednesday night, we pray intercessory prayers for people who are going through difficulties and challenges in your life. All of those kinds of prayers are legitimate, important, and in no way do I want to shortchange them. But I'm telling you, the most powerful prayer you will pray is a prayer of praise and thanksgiving to our God, from whom all blessings flow. Remember that. David shares this powerful psalm at a time when you would think there wasn't much to be thankful for or to be praising him for. It's a powerful one. When I read the New Testament words of someone like Paul, when he says, pray without ceasing, Paul's a good one. You know what prayer's Paul's prayer constantly was, it was, thank you, Lord. I just began to write all the places in Scripture where you hear Paul, who spent much of his life in prison, on the run from place to place, persecuted for his faith, you constantly hear him saying, thank you, Lord. Listen to just a couple of verses here. In 1 Corinthians 15, 57, Paul prays this, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ in the context of all the challenges he was facing. But thanks be to God who always gives us the victory. What are you going through today that you are bemoaning in your life? You know what your prayer ought to be? Thanks be to God who always gives us the victory in Jesus Christ. Listen to this one in 2 Corinthians 2.14. Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ as through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. You know what he does when we pray prayers of praise and thanksgiving? He diffuses a scent of who he is. Others will see him and know he is real when they see the power of him unleashed in your life through praise and thanksgiving. That, that's a powerful thought. And then there's this one in 2 Corinthians 9, 15. I love this. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gifts. Annie Downs wrote a book years ago about giving thanks. And in there she talks about keeping a thank list. I would encourage you to do this. Get a journal, a thick journal, and just begin to give thanks. You just begin on the first page of that journal writing all the things you're thankful for. Ask God to reveal to you all the things you have to be thankful for. You'll find yourself thanking him for the air that you breathe, right? For the drizzly mess that's out there that's messing up a Thanksgiving dinner, right? You'll find yourself thanking him for things and you'll begin to experience the presence of God like never before when you just begin to thanks be to God for his indescribable gifts. You'll be aware of how blessed you really are. And folks, I'm going to tell you, there is nothing like the power that is present in the thanks and praise that we offer to him. Now, let's get to our psalm and let's think about this a little bit. I said this is a psalm of David in Psalm 34, and I want you to look at this. Maybe your Bible doesn't have headings there, but some Bibles are study Bibles, and they may have a little note right there at the beginning of verse 34 that I want you to understand this. David wasn't having a good time when he wrote this psalm. The heading on my Bible says this, a psalm of David when he pretended to be mad, insane, before Abimelech, who drove him away, and he departed. It was so bad that David pretended to be crazy so they wouldn't kill him. That's how bad it was. And this is a powerful psalm. What's happened at this time in his life is that Sam, Saul now has realized that God has ordained David to be the next king. And Saul is angry, and you know what he's going to do with David? I'm taking him out. He threatens his life. He begins to pursue him. David tells his best friend, Jonathan, who happens to be the son of Saul, your daddy's trying to kill me. And Jonathan said, no, he's not. He said, oh yeah, test it. Jonathan found out he was. 
And Jonathan was forced to flee for his life before his own father killed him. And David was forced to flee for his. And of all places, where did he go except the town of Gath? Now, Gath was one of the three major cities, one of the five main cities, I'm going to say, of the Philistines. You remember who was from Gath? Goliath. And who killed Goliath? Cut off his head. And when that happened, the Israelites totally routed the Philistines. Guess who caused all that? God through David. Guess what sword David carried? Goliath's sword. So when he fled for his life from Saul, he headed to Gath, and when he got to Gath, they recognized him. This is the man who has slain our sons and our fathers in battle. He killed our champion, Goliath, and he's carrying his sword. Let's get him. They threw him in jail, and David began to scratch on the doorpost and foam at the mouth and pretend he was crazy, and King Abimelech eventually let him go and drove him out of town. And that's the context of this psalm. In the midst of all of that trouble, what did David begin to do? Praise and exalt and thank God. Now, I just want you to think about your life. I know that sitting in this room right now, just because I know this, some of us in this room are dealing with some pretty heavy stuff. I mean, life hasn't been good in some cases. It's been challenging. Some of you are dealing with health issues and family struggles and other kinds of things that are going on in your life. Maybe you've got loved ones you're concerned about, or maybe your heart's filled with grief for the loss of some of your loved ones. Maybe some of us don't even recognize what may be just around the corner for us, but I'm telling you that in this world, we will have trouble. There's going to be heartache. There's going to be trials. There's going to be struggles. There's going to be times when we wring our hands and we say in our heart, what do I have to be thankful for? God, how can I praise you when everything's been taken from me? I want you to know that there's a reason that God said about David, he is a man after my own heart. Because when life got worse for David, he began to praise and thank God for what he had. Folks, that's tough to do. When when the apostle Paul said, in everything give thanks, he meant in everything. In the most difficult, challenging trials of our life, we are to give thanks. Thanks. This psalm is reflections of some very dark times in David's life. It wouldn't be the last one. Many of the psalms are written by David, some of the struggles that he has in his life, and they always end up in prayers of praise and thanksgiving. Oh, that ought to be a lesson for us of how powerful this prayer can be. You see, I just believe that there's power in the praise and thanksgiving of God's people. Christian Arthur Lisa Turker says this, if there was ever a secret for unleashing God's power in a situation, it's developing a heart of true thanksgiving that gets expressed to God. I love that. If we're going to talk about the power and practice of prayer, how can we leave this one out? So simple and yet so overlooked. You mean in everything give thanks? That's what scripture says. That we're to thank him in the hard times and the difficult times, yes, because I'm telling you that prayers of power and thanksgiving unleash the power of God. You know, I'm just going to share a little personal testimony here on behalf of our church. For six years, for six years, we felt like God wanted us to build a building over there. And for six years, it got stopped. And you know what I say today? Praise the Lord. Thank you, God. Because God had a bigger plan. That's a terrible example, probably. But I can personalize it in my own life. There are things Buddy wanted that God said no, and I can say today, praise the Lord and thank you. And the same is for you today. You see, you recognize that when you serve the Lord, when you worship Him, God has a plan, and His plan is always best. And we can always praise Him. Probably my favorite, favorite song ever sung says this. I love these words. When you're up against a struggle that shatters all your dreams and your hopes have been cruelly crushed by Satan's manifested schemes, and you feel the urge within you to submit to earthly fear, don't let the faith you're standing in seem to disappear. Praise the Lord. He will work through those who praise him. Praise the Lord for our God inhabits praise. Praise the Lord for the chains that seem to bind you serve only to remind you that they drop powerless behind you when you praise him. Here's the second verse. 
Now, Satan is a liar, and he wants to make us think that we are paupers when he knows himself we're children of the king. So lift up your mighty shield of faith, for the battle must be won. We know that Jesus Christ is risen, and the work's already done. So praise the Lord. He will work through those who praise him. Praise the Lord, for our God inhabits praise. Praise the Lord, for the chains that seem to bind you serve only to remind you that they drop powerless behind you when you praise him. The most powerful prayer you will pray is one of praise and thanksgiving. That is complete in Scripture. You see, oh, no, 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 I need to pray in faith. Yes, you need to pray in faith. You need to pray in faith, believing in a God that is bigger than what you face, praising him and thanking him for that. You see, the truth of the matter is, we take this one so for granted, and so many of his blessings in our life. And my question is, David, you're giving us good advice in Psalm 34. I love this psalm. In my study Bible, this psalm is all marked up. I mean, this psalm carries great verses like, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Or what about this one? This poor man cried out and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. I love it. This psalm is filled with it. But I'm telling you, this psalm is telling us how to pray with praise and thanksgiving in such a way that it literally causes the fire of God to fall. God begins to work and move. So what does that look like? Let me give this to you a little bit. In the time that we have, I'll move quickly through this. I want you to hear. You see, I don't have to stop really early because we're eating here. You don't have to get in line at the Cracker Barrel today. So Buddy can just go on and on because food's waiting over there. We're going to feed you when we get through, okay? So y'all just buckle up and here we go. You ready? How do you, how do you pray? How do I pray this powerful prayer of praise and thanksgiving? L- let me show you what David is telling us in this tr- trial in his own life. And he, he's a good example of this. So I want you to see this. Here it is. First of all, you pray this prayer continuously. Here's point number one. Continuously pray prayers of praise and thanksgiving. Can can, can I remind you of something again this morning that's very important? You have a reason to praise the Lord. I don't care who you are this morning, what you're going through this morning, sitting in this room, you have a reason to praise the Lord. You have something to be grateful for. I love old Dr. Adrian Rogers, now gone to be with Jesus and He was famous for his quotes. As a matter of fact, he's got a great little book just called The Quotes of Adrian Rogers. Adrianisms, they call them, right? And I love this one. He used to always say this, you're either humbly grateful or you're grumbly hateful. Isn't that good? That's true. That's who we are. We're either humbly grateful or we're grumbly hateful. Unfortunately, both can exist within the Christian church at times. When the prayers of our lips ought to be humbly grateful for who he is. As followers of Jesus Christ, we should praise him continually, and it shouldn't be hard. It shouldn't be difficult. It ought to be the voice of our lips. Now, notice David's words in the first three verses here. He writes these words. Look at this. Here's what he says. I will bless the Lord when? At all times, and his praise shall, how often? Continually be in my mouth. Stop the story. Right there, he told you what our prayers ought to consist of and what they ought to look like, right? Look at verse one again. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Look at verse two. My mouth shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Folks, listen, we face challenges in this day, no doubt. There are struggles going on in our world right now that overwhelm me. If you listen to the news or you look at things going on in our world, it's frightening. Let's just be honest. It's scary when we see the things that are going on today. But when I read verses 1 through the that passage of Scripture, I realize that when I begin to praise the Lord, when I begin to thank Him, I am actually in advance of Him doing anything about all that, acknowledging that He's big enough to do something about it. That He can handle whatever we face. That's a part of our praise. Listen, the name Lord is used 16 times in this psalm. Clearly, David's focus is on praising and worshiping the Lord. Not saying, oh God, I thank you that you made me so smart that when I got arrested by King Abimelech because I'd killed Goliath and killed hundreds of Philistines, that you gave me um, 
smart enough brains that I could play like I was crazy and foam at the mouth. Is that what he said? No. He said, Lord, thank you that you never forgot me. God, I praise you for who you are. I will bless the Lord at all times, and your praise shall continually be in mouth. Over and over again, he says, my boast is not in me. My boast is in the Lord. And that's it, guys. I'm just going to tell you. I don't care what church you go to, where you worship, what you do. It's not about the music. It's not about the style of worship. It's not about what building you meet in, whether it's in a a factory building somewhere or a warehouse, or it's in a nice little building like this. It does not matter. The one you're worshiping is the one that matters. The one that you're praising is the one that matters. The one that you're exalting is the one that matters. We will make our boast in the Lord. Not about how much many numbers we have, Not about what programs we offer. Not about what building we built or what land we can buy. We will make our boast in the Lord and he will provide what we need to make our boast in the Lord. I I love that and that's who we are to be and what we're to be doing in our life. He calls attention in this psalm in very difficult circumstances in his own life to the goodness of God. I get the same idea when I read the New Testament from the Apostle Paul. Throw him in jail put his hands and feet in stocks, beat him within an inch of his life, and you know what he's going to do? He will be found singing and praying prayers of praise and thanksgiving to God, and the very jail cell will shake from the inside out. That's who we're to be, giving him thanks for who he is. You see, the truth of the matter is we're called to it, and it's to be a continuous thing. Another Adrianism He said this, one day is not long enough to thank God for all that he's given you. His blessings come daily. One day a year, folks, that's laughable. When you think of how God has blessed us, the prayer of our lips out of every single day be the most powerful prayer we can pray, and that is praise you, Lord, for who you are. Thanks be to God for who you are and all that you've done in my life, and all that you are. And I'm telling you, the first characteristic of that kind of prayer that's so powerful is that it's continuous. Mark it down. It's continuous. Here's the second thing about it. Not only is it continuous, it's cheerful. Cheerfully prayer praise, prayers of praise and, th- and gratitude. Cheerfully. C- can I just say it? I've already been saying it some. We've got a reason to be happy right? As Christians, we've got a reason to be filled with joy to over, overflowing. Christians have no reason to walk around gloomy and pouty. We just don't. I mean, the truth of the matter is that the life of a Christian, no matter what he's going through, ought to be filled with this joy overflowing in all things. I'm not telling you that everything we go through is a happy moment. I'm not telling you that there won't be times of sadness and it won't be, we won't face hardships and difficulties in life. But as the half-brother of Jesus said it, count it all joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. You see, the truth of the matter is, you and I have a reason to be happy because of who he is. Another one of the great preachers that I used to love to listen to, and I have several of his books, I love his books, is Dr. Stan Coffey, who pastored at San Jacinto Baptist Church in Amarillo, Texas for many, many years. Very, very powerful, spirit-filled preacher He too is now gone to be with the Lord. As a matter of fact, God keeps calling all of our good ones home. Like you got Adrian Rogers now, you got Billy Graham up there with you, you got Stan Coffey, you got these guys come, I mean, come on, God. (laughs) But we still get to enjoy their sermon. Stan Coffey pastored at San Jacinto Baptist Church in Amarillo, Texas for many, many years. And he said this about his church at one time and the joy that flowed from those Christians. And this is a quote from him. He said, Someone once said about San Jacinto in derision, San Jacinto Baptist Church is nothing but a pep rally for Jesus. Well, folks, he said, I want to tell you, I would rather have a pep rally for Jesus than a funeral for Jesus. Amen? My Lord is alive. My Lord came out of the grave. My Lord is on the right hand of God. My Lord is on the throne. We have a living Savior. 
I want to tell you, Jesus Christ is alive, and it's a truth that history cannot repeat, a truth that time cannot corrode, and a truth that science cannot explain. Jesus Christ came out of the grave, and he is alive forevermore. Folks, we have a reason to be happy, right? We serve a risen Savior. He is alive. He indwells us. He fills us. He blesses us. He walks through us. Scripture tells us he'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us, even when we mess up and are ornery and are hard-headed. He's still right there with us. We have a reason to rejoice in him. A Sunday school teacher asked her class what they were thankful for. Thanksgiving was approach it, approaching, and she thought it would be a great lesson for many of them to just talk about things they were thankful for. She got the typical responses. I'm thankful for my mommy and daddy. I'm thankful for my home. I'm thankful for my bicycle. But one little boy said, I'm thankful for my glasses. When asked why he was thankful for his glasses, when most little boys would be bitter about having to wear them, he said, because they keep the boys from hitting me and the girls from kissing me. (laughs) I mean, come on, you can find something to be thankful for, right? I love that. If we read the appropriate chapters in 1 Samuel carefully, we will discover that David was at one of the lowest points in his life. Everything he cared about, everything that he loved had been taken from him. He'd had to leave his favorite job that he'd ever had just simply sitting out in the fields watching over sheep to go play an instrument for a king who was ungrateful and constantly throwing spears at him. Finally, that king lost his mind and drove him from the place along with his best friend and David's alone, even though he had many times saved Saul's neck, even by killing the dreaded Goliath against the Philistines. Now he is alone by himself. And here's what we read in verse four. Look at it. I sought the Lord and he heard me and he delivered me from all my fears. Verse six, look at it. This poor man cried out and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. Look at verses 17 and 18. The righteous cry out and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such as have a contrite spirit. I wonder how David knew that because that's where he was. And some of us have been there. We've had trouble and we've known fears. Our heart's been troubled and broken at times. We've struggled. And yet I like David's heart here. What am I going to do when my fears come crashing in? and my troubles prevail? What am I going to do when I can't find deliverance? I can't get over it. Here's what he did. I sought the Lord. I praised him. I thanked him. I sought him, and he delivered me out of all of my fears. There's a sequence, a pathway here that I love. I don't know if you noticed that, but notice this. First, there's trouble. David speaks of his many fears in verse 4, and in verse 6, he speaks of all of his troubles. Well, folks, listen, we all have trouble in this world. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. That's a reason to praise and thank him. Because whatever we're going through, what has he promised? Be of good cheer, right? I've overcome the world. How can you be cheerful in praise and thanksgiving? Well, there it is. And David knew it. First, there was trouble. Second, there was prayer. Verse six, verse four, I've sought the Lord. Verse six, this poor man cried out. Then third, notice there was deliverance. You see it? Verse four, he, the Lord, heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Verse six, the Lord heard me and saved me out of all of my troubles. And then fourth, there was cheerfulness, radiance. Do you see it? Verse five kind of sticks out in this passage of scripture because it talks about David crying out in all of his trouble. And then look at verse five, it says, they looked to him and were radiant. And their faces were not ashamed. I want to be like that. When when trials pressure me, when the struggles come, when hardships hit, when fears prevail, when trouble hits me, I want to be radiant. You know how you're radiant? When you're praising and thanking him in spite of it. You become radiant. And that's a powerful thing for us to understand. How are we to praise him? We're to praise him despite our circumstances. On a balmy October day, in the afternoon in in 1982, I'm sorry, at Badger Stadium in Madison, Wisconsin, the stadium was packed. 
More than 60,000 diehard University of Wisconsin supporters were there to support their team as they took on the Michigan State Spartans. It soon became very obvious that Michigan State was the better team, a much, much better team, as they were literally cleaning the clock of the Badgers. What seemed off, however, was that as the score became more and more lopsided, the burst of applause and shouts of joy coming from the Wisconsin stands were amazing. How could they cheer when their team was losing so badly in such a rout? It didn't make any sense. They were literally getting whipped all over the field, and yet Wisconsin fans were cheering wildly. It turned out that 70 miles away, the Milwaukee Brewers were beating the St. Louis Cardinals <laughs> in Game 3 of the 1982 World Series. Many of those fans in the stands that day were listening on headsets and portable radios, not responding to something other than their immediate circumstances, right? You see, it's, it's all in how you look at it, right? I mean, it can look bad here. We can look like we're in the nat ninth inning and we're not going to win. And I'm telling you, if you're a believer, you're going to win. Praise him. Thank him. Despite your circumstances, because for a Christian, Our earthly circumstances are never what they seem. So here's how you praise and thank him. You pray, do it continuously, do it cheerfully. Here's third, let me say this to you, do it carefully. Do it carefully. I'm gonna move through these. I got two more points, four points today, guys, because we're eating over there. Remember, you're not having, (laughs) we'll go there. Do it carefully, carefully pray prayers of praise and thanksgiving. Now, why would I say that it's important to pray prayers of praise and gratitude carefully? For one thing, the way you worship should be backed up by the way you live. It's, it's not enough, folks, to come to church on Sunday and put on a big, happy Christian smile and look the part and sing the songs of praise. It has to come from here. It's got to well up in your heart. You and I as believers ought to be grateful and thankful and what we do outwardly ought to be expression of what's happening inwardly. You and I ought to have such a heart that overflows with them that it changes how we relate to other people. It changes how we relate to our circumstances. It changes how we look at others, how we respond to others, and how we worship. Prayers of praise and thanksgiving that are powerful begin in the heart of a believer who has been touched by a powerful God. That's what happened with us. Listen, God is not impressed with words. Even words in prayer that praise and thank him. He is impressed with the heart. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. You and I ought to be sure that our heart matches our words, that our life lives up to what we're professing with our lips. Now, you hear preachers say that all the time, but we go around saying, praise the Lord, thank the Lord, thank the Lord. Listen, I'm telling you, those are just words unless they're coming from a heart that's truly grateful. It it ought to flow from us. It ought to be who we are. You and I ought to pray like that. Now, I want you to notice David's words in verses 11 through 14 of our psalm. Here's what he says. Listen to this. Come, you children, listen to me, and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is the man who desires life and loves many days? That he may see good. Here it is. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. I've read this psalm many, many times, and I've never thought about this before. It's not about what comes from your lips. It's actually evil for us to praise God and not be praising him in here. It's actually evil for us to be thanking God, but inside in our hearts, we're not grateful. I mean, you and I ought to recognize that what this scripture is calling us to is that David was grateful to God from the depths of his being and who he was. Was David perfect? Never. I mean, this man after God's own heart messed up all the time. And you know what? That gives me hope because I do too. But God hears the depths of a heart and a life that's filled with praise and thanksgiving, acknowledging him. That's a powerful prayer for us. You and I have to pray that way. We have to recognize it. Be careful that what we show here on Sunday matches how we live on Monday. Be sure that the praises that are reflected from our life today in worship and thanksgiving isn't just a Sunday event for you, 
Folks, I'm going to tell you something. I hear this all the time. We come to church on Sunday so we can get our tank filled, so we can go back out the rest of the week and expend all of that tank filling, right? No, we come in here on Sunday, we worship him, and we walk out of here on Monday and we worship and praise and thank him, and we go to Tuesday and we worship and praise and thank him, and we go to Wednesday and we're still worshiping and praising and thanking him, and we get to Thursday and guess what we're doing? Praising and thanking him, and Friday we're praising and thanking him, and Saturday we're praising and thanking him, another longhorn win, right? And Sunday we get back here and we go, God, thank you for a full week of your presence, your power, I thank you. Do you see it? That ought to be the life of a Christian. Be careful that you aren't saying it with your lips, but not living it. And here's the fourth one, all right? My time's gone, so I'm gonna give it to you, and it's a good one. Pray confidently. Pray prayers of praise and thanksgiving confidently. Look at verse eight. This is why you can do it confidently. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. There is no want to those who fear him. The young lion lacks and suffers hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Now, why did he mention a lion? Well, that's the king of the jungle. That's the king of the all animal kingdom, right? That's that's the king, but he lacks. But what about the life of a believer? Never lacks never lacks because God is always with us. That's why we can pray prayers of thanksgiving with confidence. You see, whatever's happening in our world, I can say thank you, Lord, because of who he is. I want to close with this, and I found this this week, and I just thought this was so good. This is called the ABCs of thanksgiving, of a heart of thanksgiving. And I love it because it's simple, as simple as the ABCs. But it just reflects this heart of thanksgiving. So these will be on the screen, so you're going to kind of run through them with me um, as I do this. But, but I just want you to see this, and I want you to think about it. This is the ABCs of Thanksgiving. Here's what it goes. Although things are not perfect because of trial or pain, continue on in Thanksgiving. Do not begin to blame. Even when the times are hard, fierce winds are bound to blow. God is forever able. Hold on to what you know. Imagine life without his love. Joy would cease to be. Keep thanking him for all the things love imparts to thee. Move out of camp complaining. No weapon that is known. On earth can yield the power praise can do alone. Quit looking at the future. Redeem the time at hand. Start every day with worship. To think is a command. Until we see him coming, victorious in the sky, we'll run the race with gratitude, exalting God most high. Yes, there'll be good times and some difficulties will come, but Zion waits in glory, and there our grateful heart will find our heavenly home. That's the life of a Christian, right? Something to be thankful for. Folks, listen, we can talk about prayer from now until Jesus comes, but the most important, powerful prayer you will pray is the one we're going to pray a lot this week. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his precious blood that's opened a way for me to come boldly into your presence in prayer. Thank you for the hope of heaven, for the forgiveness of sin. Thank you for your blessing of family and friends and those that gather around us. Thank you that you sustain me in the valleys. Thank you that you walk with me through times of illness and sickness. Thank you, Lord, that every single day when the world doesn't have hope, you have given me hope and peace and joy despite all the circumstances. And thank you that one day, there awaits to me a voice that will say, well done, good and faithful servant. You and I need to be thankful and it needs to be expressed in the most powerful prayer you can pray. Would you bow with me forward a prayer? With heads bowed and eyes closed, I'm gonna ask Carol if she would just begin to play our hymn of invitation this morning, our hymn of response. I hope you get it, Right? That in this time of response, even with our heads bowed and our eyes closed and just me talking for a minute, that you're talking to God right now. Saying, thank you, Lord. Thank you for the things I don't understand. Thank you for the challenges and the difficulties that I've experienced because, God, you have seen me through them all. Thank you for the hope and the victory that I have every day. Listen, Christian, be praying that powerful prayer because he inhabits the praise, the thanks of his people. 
If you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus Christ, I thank God that you're here because God wants to speak to your heart and he wants to save you right now. He wants to give you eternal life and a hope and a future if you'll just call on him. And it's simple. I mean, the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's all you gotta do. Thank you, Lord, that you made it easy. You died on the cross for us to pay for our sins. All we gotta do is confess to you and you wash us clean and you give us a relationship and we can know you forever. It's that simple. You see, I don't know what God's saying in your heart or in your life this morning, but I I do know that all over this room, we ought to be praising Him, thanking Him with this powerful prayer, lifting up His name. So we're gonna sing it here in just a minute. We're gonna declare it in worship, in thanksgiving. His name is wonderful. We're gonna worship Him. We're gonna thank Him. And if you need to respond this morning, we're gonna invite you to respond. Our ministers will be at the front. The altar is open. That seat or that pew where you're sitting can be an altar where you just slip to your knees and say, thank you, thank you. Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. God, pour out your spirit on us in this time of response. Take your word that we've heard this morning, this beautiful song inspired by you that you put on the lips of David. Prayers of praise and thanksgiving to you. Help us to pray our own this morning, praising you. And God, you let your spirit fall on us in this time. And if there's those who need to come, who need to respond, give them the courage to step out in faith and to come. And we will give you all the praise and the honor and glory. Father, we love you, we worship you. And as we rise to worship you in this song, fill this place with your presence. It's in your name I ask these things. Amen. Would you stand with us as we sing this beautiful song of worship before we close today? Let's just praise Him, thank Him, and worship. And if you need to come, you come as we sing. song, isn't it? Just reminding ourselves uh, of the one that we worship and praise today. Um, Thank you guys for being here this morning, for worshiping with us. I hope that you will all plan to stay um, and and, and, and join us for a wonderful time of fellowship around the table. Uh, I think it's a great opportunity for us believers to just uh, get to thank him even for our family, right? Uh, For those we worship with. Uh, and exalt his name together with. So thank you for doing that. Don't forget about opportunities of service. Um, Trey did a great job. Those are all in your bulletin, even in those nice little inserts that fall out in your lap sometimes. Um, Those are reminders of things that when that hits your lap, it reminds you, oh, I need to go to that, right? Um, Don't forget about all of that. Uh, Don't forget this afternoon, young people, about the turkey bowl. Uh, Some of you adults, if you're wondering about how you bowl a turkey, uh, drive by the church this afternoon and just peek. You'll get to see 
something really interesting. Y'all yeah, get in line. That's right. Um, that'll be that'll be fun. And then tomorrow, don't forget, hang into the green work day. Uh, you come serve with us. It starts with nine, about nine o'clock, and then um, we're going to have a light lunch. So if you come and serve, we want to feed you in, and you'll get to have another chance at a, a nice little light lunch um, for coming and helping us with that. And then we're looking forward to next Sunday, uh, getting to worship together um, as we welcome in the Christmas season. So um, don't forget about all those opportunities of service. All right, here's what we're going to do. Brother JD is going to come up and lead us um, in our closing prayer today. And Brother J.D., if you don't mind, the ladies ask if you would bless the food, okay? So when they get over there, they can start eating. Um, <laughs> if you're on a walker or a wheelchair or you have a hard time standing in line, if you will take a seat, all right? Y'all hear me? Take a seat. You can do it. Our deacons are going to serve you, okay? So um, our older folks who have a hard time standing and waiting in line, um, if you'll go ahead and take a seat, one of them will come by you and they'll offer to fix your plate. Now, if there's something you don't like, you need to say, I don't like blah, 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 okay? <laughs> or, uh, they, and they might pile it on anyway, I don't know. But um, so, so if you're one of those, um, as soon as we're dismissed, we want you to head on over there and get you a place, if you would. There, are, there is places to sit inside, okay? So um, anyway, so that's my instructions from the kitchen ladies, and we've got to keep the kitchen ladies happy. Right. Another one. Okay. Okay. Did y'all all hear that? Silverware's on the table. We'll be indoors in both the Fellowship Hall and the K building. So there's places already there uh, for you to sit. Okay. Um, so there's the instructions. Come pray and bless the food. We'll sing the family of God. And then you guys get to go eat. Don't have to wait in line at Cracker Barrel. Right. So, there you go. Lead us, Actually, I'm up here again today uh, filling in for Brother Tandy Reed. You know, many of you are aware that uh, he's uh, recovering from heart surgery right now. So please keep him in your thoughts and prayers as well. Uh, let us pray, Lord. Uh, good heavens, we think at this time of the year that nationally this is the day of Thanksgiving, but for each of us it's also a, a period of Thanksgiving, Lord. We ask that you would bless this food to the nourish of our bodies. Uh, the hands that prepared it as well, Lord, bless everyone, keep us safe, bring us back again, Lord, but thank you most of all for your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, for what he's done for us, for our salvation. Thank you. Amen. Let's hold hands across the aisle as we sing the family of God. Amen.